This is the Girly Men Podcast. My name is Mike Gurley, and I am the host and founder of GurlyMen.com, a site for gay men and anyone self-identified as the other, designed to help you invest in your own dignity, strengthen your connection to your chosen families, and thrive in general society. Now that you found us, please hit that subscribe button. Contact me directly with questions or comments. We just might play them on the podcast. Email me at mike at girlymen.com. That's mike at g-e-r-l-e-m-e-n dot com. Today, I talk with Aaron Ferranti Allen. Aaron is a very close friend of mine who I deeply respect for his intellect and his bravery, but most importantly, for his vulnerable honesty. He's a man I consider family, and I'm thrilled to have him here on the podcast speaking about his professional specialty, sex and relationships, and how all that relates to our mental health. Enjoy the show. The moment you realized you were a gay man, you were forced onto the path of the other. So you know oppression inside and out. The calling of otherness has led you on your own hero's journey, and that journey has prepared you for greatness. You are a man answering the call to brotherhood, to conscious sex, and to heart-centered connection. Welcome home, brother. Joining us today is Aaron Ferranti Allen. He is a very dear friend of mine, a man I consider family. We have many years of history together, but today I am going to be talking to him about his professional life. Uh, Welcome to the podcast, Aaron. Thank you, Mike. It's good to be here. That was a nice intro. Well, it's true. It's all true. Um, so my first question um, I've been starting to ask everybody is, how are you feeling? And you may be the first person to actually a- be able to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Today is Saturday, April 25th, 2020. The coronavirus is raging. You're at home with your husband. You're doing most of your professional life is on screen, I suppose. Yes. Yep. So how are you feeling in Uh, general? Actually, surprisingly well. Um, The whole situation is upsetting, but in terms of what's happening in our home, I'm doing well. I love spending time with my husband and I'm able to work doing Zoom with my clients and keep my profession going. Now, the actual location of where I work, that's a whole other story because, you know, rents are all a mess, but, and that's a stressor. I don't, I'm not feeling it all the time. It's only when I think about it, but uh, in terms of how I'm doing overall, I'm actually doing pretty well. That's I, I awesome. I working out. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. That's, that's the one thing I actually really miss. <laughs> and of course, connecting with people personally. And, yeah. It's a big uh, adjustment. And uh, it is, I, but I, you know, it, this actually appeals to my lazy side. <laughs> staying in bed, <laughs> you know, maybe not taking a shower right away. <laughs> yeah, if at all, you know, some for me. I I'm know speaking it's good for, for myself, health, which is kind of funny. Like I, like here I am telling people, okay, you know, good hygiene, take care of yourself, eat, take a shower, get dressed. Like I'm not always doing that. Yeah, and I, I do appreciate too, uh, since um, you are a sex therapist is that how would you describe yeah, I'm, like, I'm a licensed mental health professional uh-huh. i'm a licensed therapist and my focus is on sex relationships trauma and addictions but it's it, primarily sex and relationships awesome so um you know what attracted you to psychology and why did you choose this specialty well i got sober in my late 20s and that journey pushed me to think about okay what do i want to do for the rest of my life what can I age with? What can I develop and help me develop? And what I came to was psychology and therapy. And I went back to school, got my master's in clinical psychology. And then I started practicing as an intern before I got licensed at the Gay and Lesbian Center. And I thought I was going to do addiction recovery work because of my personal background. Mm-hmm. And then I got one of my first paying jobs out of grad school was actually working at a uh, center that treats people with I got a job working at a sexual treatment center on a professional level and actually working there was not a good place for me. But the clinical work itself, working with people who had out of control sexual behaviors appealed to me. I mean, sex is interesting. Uh, We all understand or know, we all know sex and working with people that were out of control with that part of their life, it spoke to me. I understood their pain. I understood the, um, the compulsion. Mm-hmm. So the work appealed to me. 
And I ended up doing work around sexual compulsivity and out of control sexual behavior. And at the time, I was referring to it as sex addiction. I uh-huh. don't call it that anymore. Um, That's I, really interesting. So can you talk about that paradigm when people were and still are sometimes talking about it as sexual addiction and how you evolved? Yeah, yeah. So I built my practice uh, working predominantly with the sex addiction model. And the model never quite sat with me. You know, I, I never really felt like it was a, the, a perfect fit. What I came to realize was that the, the addiction model, it's easy to understand when you put sex into the addiction model, but it doesn't actually really fit. So I don't see it as an addiction. I see it more as a compulsion, more as out of control behavior. And mm-hmm. when I started to shift my language around it, my ideas started to shift around it. Okay. What parts of the model didn't fit? Well, the, that it's, that's an addiction. Using the addiction model, addiction is, is binary. Like you're, you're doing it or you're not doing it. And it works well for substance abuse, like yeah. alcohol. Either you're drinking, you're not drinking. Cocaine, you're snorting or you're not snorting. Yeah. With sex, it's not binary. It's like there's, it's really just a, people are engaging in a destructive twist on a normal life experience. Mm. And behavior can get out of control, but um, so I so, said, well, it sounds like you're looking at the behavior rather than just labeling sex outside of this box is bad. <laughs> and right. you're focusing on the behavior. The addiction model is what you're doing it, you're not doing it. So it, it's not a really very good way to look at sexual behavior because we can say, okay, there's these specific behaviors might be out of control. And then there's, okay, what you consider healthy behaviors. And this is all self-defined. This is not like, there's no rule about what is healthy and what isn't healthy. It's really a definition you have to work to and come to yourself. And then there's a massive gray area in between. And the addiction model doesn't really address that. People can identify their bottom line behaviors and you can stay away from those, but counting time and counting days when it comes to sex, I think can be really problematic. And so with the big part I heard about in that is that you're saying that it's self-defined as opposed to like a substance abuse thing. It's like I either did or did not drink today. And that's right. Really, well, well, there are, it's like, there, there it's are like I, I, I wouldn't be able to go into a 12. So I was in 12 step program for 25 years and I no longer am. But it was I was either participating in the program 100 percent or I was I had slipped. I had right. to start over. Mm-hmm. Um, I couldn't say, well, yeah, I just had one drink today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that, right, right. It's it's hard to apply that to sex and sexuality because we need to connect to people. You know, so then you were saying, never say someone needs alcohol. Yeah, yeah. Right. So then you were saying it's about behavior. It's about compulsivity. So that's so. Talk more about that. About how that was part of your evolution was was focusing on that. Well, what what I was seeing. I mean, there are some recovery programs that define sexual sobriety for you. And the more extreme mm. conservative ones, which is, it's largely a very conservative field, yeah. sexually conservative uh, field. The more extreme ones define sexual behavior, uh, excuse me, destructive sexual behavior as no sex outside of a marriage, no masturbation. And before gay people were allowed to marry, what that really meant was you had to shut your sexuality down and become abstinent and celibate. Yeah. In order to be in recovery. And that is destructive. It, it really is. And one of the negative things about the religion I was <clears throat> raised in, I'll put this in the show notes, is we actually had a, I felt very, the, the only time I felt close to killing myself is when I was trying to not be gay and not masturbate. And they had this like 10 page manual on how to not masturbate when you're 15, 16, 17 years old. And I still personally, as someone with no actual background, but a lot of lifetime experience to say that that's, that's a lot to put on a teenager. It's completely unrealistic. <laughs> yeah. And it's yeah. not healthy. And it doesn't, I, it doesn't acknowledge the realities of human sexuality and sexual development. Yeah. All the it realities did for me. of being a social creature, which is what humans are. Yeah. It, it did provide a mechanism for me to feel really, really bad about myself. <laughs> <laughs> and and, that's and my... a lot, I saw a lot of that with the sex addiction model. So over the years, I just came to see the problem differently. I, so I slowly let go of the addiction model in 
treating people with sexual compulsivity and have adopted more of what's called OCSB, which is out of control sexual behavior. Okay. So um, before we talk about out of control sexual behavior, maybe can you tell me what a, what good sexual behavior is? Like, how can I tell after sex, whether or not I've had a good sexual yeah, encounter? Yeah, there's, there's a, a questions you can ask yourself. Now, I would never say this specific behavior is good or bad because for someone, let's say autoerotic asphyxiation, I'm, I'm going to make an extreme example just to illustrate that point. <laughs> <Okay>. um, <laughs> autoerotic <laughs> asphyxiation for one person can be a part of a healthy BDSM uh, sexual experience. For someone else, if they were assaulted and choked during the assault, they could be actually re-traumatizing themselves mm. with a reenactment of a trauma, traumatic experience. Now, they, there you can make a psychological argument that they might be trying to un psychologically undo the experience by having control over it today versus not having control over it yesterday or in the past. You can make an argument that they're actually working through it, but um, that would really require a high degree of self-awareness and usually the help of yeah. the therapist to help guide you through it. But two Identical experiences for one person, it could be destructive, and for another person, it could be completely fine. So, the, the, for, the, for I, the I want to person, come back to the question. You, okay, you asked yeah. that, I want to answer the question because okay. I think it was a really good question. So, you, you said, How do you know if something was healthy or unhealthy? How do I know if it was healthy, is what you said. Yes. Asking yourself, Is it shaming? Do I feel bad about myself afterwards? Am I being secretive? Am I lying to somebody? Is it destructive? Meaning, is it harming me? Is it harming someone else? Am I exploiting another person? So mm. if, if the answer to these questions is no, you're probably fine. Okay. But then that leads to other like deeper questions is like, do I feel shame? But where's that shame coming from? You know? Right, right, is right. There's different kinds of shame. There's shame that informs us like, okay, this is not the person I want to be. And I don't like, I would, if I harmed somebody and I feel shame about it, that's not a bad thing. That's my conscience telling me, mm -hmm. don't do that. And so that can guide me to doing, having, engaging in behavior that doesn't generate shame. Shame can also be toxic, which is when we get messaging from our community, from churches, from society, telling us that you're bad for wanting that specific kind of sex. You're bad for masturbating. You're bad for being gay. That's toxic. There's nowhere to go with that. Yeah. And then, so I know I have way too much experience carrying around that kind of shame myself. And, and there's a lot of things I did with it. But how do you, what's your advice for people who experience that kind of shame? The shame that comes from, not from doing something that's, that's exploiting another person or the shame that comes from stealing or being dishonest, but the shame of, 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 of a, yeah, toxic shame that comes from, other people's values being imposed on you. The best way to reduce shame is to talk about it and shed light on it. Shame is reinforced in secrecy and mm. in quiet and isolating around it. Mm. Opening up to people who understand, opening up to people who would be accepting and not judging and talking about it is a great way to start releasing shame. That's amazing. And I assume a therapist um, is a great listen, place let, to start. Yeah, is there anybody else? Is a great place. Sure. Listen, mm -hmm. like, so when you came from Idaho and you moved to West Hollywood, I'm sure you noticed a profound shift in how you felt about yourself. Oh my God. Yes. You know, coming from a community that was judging you either explicitly or implicitly, even just by not being mirrored. Um, yes. The message is you're not okay. And coming to West Hollywood where you are mirrored and you're affirm and no one's judging you for your sexuality, you're accepted, you're celebrated. Mm -hmm. sexuality that shed shame so you're in a much freer space you're connecting to people with who are similar so seeing myself in other people so i uh, talk to people like that um i have you know i visit tucson i've where fa i have family i visit kearney missouri where i have family mm -hmm. and i don't usually see any gay people when i'm there and if somebody's listening there what do you mean by mirroring I mirroring is when we see ourselves in others you know, think of it like um, a psychological mirror. Think, real, think about an actual mirror and a person, we see ourselves reflected in somebody else. So you're saying just by seeing another gay person that's thriving and... Or just seeing and, another gay person. Or just seeing whether another gay person. Whether they're thriving or not is actually not relevant. It's just seeing another person that is like us. It's, it's okay. affirming because the message, the, the meta message, the message underneath that is you're okay. You're not alone. You're not fucked up. There's nothing wrong with you. Hmm. 
you know, there are others like you. And those are all positive messages. Wow. So and right, right here in this are one of the yeah. gay people are the only community that are not mirrored by our parents. Yeah. Well, usually it's changing now, but by and large, we are the only community that's not mirrored by our parents. Think about that. Yeah. Think what the impact on our community, on what each one of us is and growing up in a family that's not like us. I know everybody's different, but can you generalize and say like, what are, what do you think are some of the impacts of, of that, of growing up? first with parents who don't mirror us and then maybe our other institutions aren't mirroring us what can happen with gay people we we learn to hide we learn to become really good at deception we learn to take care of our needs without the support of other people which can interfere in how we develop relationships yeah and so that is part of it you know the question i ask later is like sometimes it's like is coming out a hero's journey. We'll talk about that later. I think this mm-hmm. speaks to that a little bit. I think we can go two different ways. We can go into victim or we can go into hero. And sometimes you need to go through one to get to the other. What do you think? I think there's a third path, Mike. And I think it, we could go into punisher, perpetrator, villain. Oh my God, I hadn't thought of that. Well, can you talk yeah, I, about all three of those outcomes? So we're talking about mirroring and mm-hmm. then not having that and the impact on that. Uh, on a on a gay well, man or a gay what, boy, what what are the different? Can you yeah, talk to those yeah. three? Well, three? When we talk about three unhealthy tracks, what leads to drama? What leads to toxicity? Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, one is the hero, which I think of it as like the archetype hero, where we're throwing ourselves on the track. We're, we're the best student. We're the best child. Thinking of hero as an impenetrable, excuse me, a person with an impenetrable exterior, mm-hmm. where we become bulletproof. And mm-hmm. when we're bulletproof, we're not, people are not able to reach us. We're inaccessible. And that usually leads to feeling bad about yourself or feeling disconnected. Yeah. The other track is victimhood, victimization, and what, what you said. Mm-hmm. And victimization is where we're not responsible. Other people are responsible for our problems. We can wallow in self-pity or sink into self-pity. We're unable to operate in our own best interest when we're in a state of victim. Okay. Disempowered? Disempowered, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then the, the third track is perpetration. You know, uh, I forgot about anger. that one. Yeah, which is fueled by anger and anger and resentment. And we can feel justified lashing out and hurting people because yeah. we're harmed. Are, are you talking about any... Uh, Senators or Congress people in particular. Yeah, I think. I mean, yeah, internalized homophobia can lead. Yeah. You know, it yeah. Out. So when we face that, and I think that gets to our first question, you know, uh, overcoming shame. What can happen if we do that work and we overcome it? Do you think that we're better for the experience, or would it have been better that we oh, just we not be, have had yeah, that experience? We're, if we're, we can be better for the experience if we're able to work through it and emerge on the other side. If we're actually able to do the work, because we come out on the other side more self-aware, less shame, usually less less destructive behaviors. We're able to connect to others. Our best self is allowed to come forward, and that's good for us. That's good for everybody. Yeah, that does sound great. That does sound good. So part of that, I think one thing I didn't learn, um, this is about boundaries growing up was, I think I was kind of in the victim hero thing um, in high school and uh, being the perfect kid and um, having life happen to me. I didn't understand boundaries, that I had any sort of self agency. And this is something that I've talked to you about privately. And I still think I I struggle with that because I want to be the best people pleaser person around. Mm-hmm. Um, can, can you talk about the importance of bound, what boundaries are, um, the importance of boundaries? Well, the boundaries allow us to know who we are and where we end and someone else begins. It's knowing the difference between me and another person, me and another thing. And when I know who I am, I'm better able to operate in the world. So, I mean, that's like the most basic definition I could probably give. Well, and then I think that gets to what I, some other things that we've been talking about was our intuition. So for me to know who I am, I, I need to be able to hear that intuition and follow it. Mm. Is, that, is that what you're saying? Wait, say that again. Well, if, if I need to know that um, a boundary separates me from another person or institution, first mm. I, I need to know who I am and I need to know my inner self like um, if, somehow. You can also know who you're not. You know, and I think that okay. uh, when drama and toxicity start to develop, we're probably not using good boundaries when crazy making develops. Mm-hmm. When, thing, when we feel like things are coming off the rails, 
or things feel inappropriate or they don't, they feel messy. Mm-hmm. Chances are you're not really engaging in very good boundaries. Do you have any examples of that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, being secretive is a poor boundary. Triangulation is a poor boundary. Uh, Burning everything it? out that comes to the top of your mind is a poor boundary. <laughs> 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 Because, because because I'm not sub- separating when I'm just blurting everything out that's on my mind. I'm not separating saying that I have my own stuff and you have your own stuff. Right. And right. That's, right. You're just melting all over the place. And also not knowing where I end and another person begins can lead to enmeshment. You know, yeah. Where, where we're locked together. Well, some of the best advice you ever gave to me is that no is a complete sentence. And I'll use this. I don't know who's listening to this. I don't know if anybody will put this together. But um, I reached out to you because I didn't want to be um, give somebody a ride to an event that was five hours each direction. And <laughs> and I thought I needed to explain myself. And I, I, I think, I don't know, I, I, I had a whole book in my head about why I didn't need to do this and how I could explain it. And this person is that and whatever. And I'm this. And I I'm, here's our whole history together. And you said... No is a complete sentence. <laughs> yeah, the, the, I don't want to do that is valid. I think sometimes people feel the need to have a legitimate reason, you know, mm-hmm. legitimate as defined by that person, that just because I don't want to do it is somehow not good enough so people feel like they have to have a reason to do something versus I'm not up for that. You know, that, that, that doesn't appeal to me or I'm too tired. I don't feel, I don't feel like it. Yeah. And I guess one of the reasons I'm so into this is because when I first moved to California from Idaho, I was 20 years old. I was, you know, cruising for sex and um, I was in bars and I was still like this good, perfect boy who didn't like to make waves and wanted to make everybody happy. And I ended up literally the short story is having sex with people I didn't want to have sex with because I didn't want to be rude. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And yeah, so that's a poor boundary right there. It's a terrible boundary. And yeah. and the answer was like, I'm just, the answer is no. And I don't need to engage. I had this other guy telling me I was a bad person because I wouldn't have sex with him because, you know. Well, that's actually how people pull you back into the drama and into the toxic relationship. Now, granted, somebody you're hooking up with isn't a relationship as we would normally think of, but you are engaging with the person. Yeah. The people, that's a very common tool, which is you're a bad person. And that's how they pull you back into orbit, and, you back into rescuing. And I want to talk to anybody who's young or new at negotiating sex that you know, period, is all you need to give somebody. We all have that agency over our, our bodies and our Agency self. is a, a really important topic when we talk about self-determination, boundaries, knowing who we are. And agency is just our, our ability to act in our own best interest. And yeah. I, and I don't mean that in a selfish or self-centered way. I just mean it in the very simple being able to act for yourself. Yeah. So we've been talking about boundaries. Actually, I was just talking about negotiating sex and um, not the way I remember it was I would make a different decision today. I just like have a general feeling about hookup culture. How do you feel about hookup culture? Is it fun and connecting and community or is it uh, you know obsessive, compulsive, sexual addictive behavior? I love hookup uh, culture. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it's tremendous. I mean, I it, it it's like anything. I I think if it's a part of someone's sexual experience and sexual expression, fine. It like anything, it can get out of control. If that's the only way that we're connecting with other people, and listen, I get it. It feels good. It does feel like a connection. But if if we're engaging in only hookups and we're not nourishing ourselves by having deeper connections or more intimate connections with others, then it will end up feeling empty. And mm-hmm. that think of it like a balanced diet. It's like, and you're, and you're only eating crackers. You're going to end up in a malnourished state and sexually we're not a lot different. Okay. So you're saying it's one course on the menu. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so then what are the other courses? So are, can you, can you, can you be to, my yeah. waiter? Can you be my waiter and describe, <laughs> um, um, what's the hookup? What's, what, what will I get when I have some hookup culture? What will I get with a, uh, with a long-term relationship? Um, All of those things are, what do I get from my friends? Sexual diet. I like to think of it as food. This is why. <laughs> yeah. Food. Um, sometimes I love a five course meal with my husband with the white linens and the candles going but we don't eat every meal like that and you know sometimes sexually we do have a protracted experience 
sometimes I just like to stand in front of the refrigerator and just <laughs> gorge on whatever happens to be in front of me. Or sometimes I just like to look at it and then I close the door and realize, okay, I'm bored. Yeah. Or I'll eat a whole bag of potato chips or I'll make a sandwich or I'll make my husband and me a sandwich or I'll make somebody else a sandwich, <laughs> you know, and I'll, or I'll go out to eat. You know, it, my diet and the way that I eat is varied. Mm -hmm. I think a balanced sexual life would be similar. I'm just wondering if more specifics would be useful uh, for describing well, this. I, 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 can, I, can I get the metaphor. Me. I can speak yeah. about me. I love being married to my husband. I mm -hmm. get a lot of fulfillment from it. I love connecting with him. I love talking with him. I love being intimate with him, both emotionally, sexually, physically. And that fulfills a large part of my life. I also like hooking up. And I really enjoy it and it's fun. And sometimes I do it with my husband and sometimes I don't, but I couldn't, my life couldn't sustain on just one or the other. I for me, I, I wouldn't feel fulfilled if all I was doing was hooking up and I wouldn't feel fulfilled if all I had was my marriage, mm -hmm. which is why I've integrated the two. So have an open relationship. yeah, well, let's talk about that integration mm -hmm. and let's talk about an open relationship. And I, first I want to start off by by saying, I, I know that you and I agree that open or monogamous or whatever is is each each individual person's choice. Absolutely, that, that it's it, you're not prescribing this for. No, everybody. no, no, no. This is just what works for me and so, what works so, for my husband. Yeah. This is just with, how with I'm that, together. And with that disclaimer, yeah. So, can you tell us about yeah, that? Yeah, I, I don't have judgment about people's sexual choices. You know, it. My interest is purely how it impacts somebody. Mm -hmm. That's that's really where my interest lies. All right, what was the question? So you were describing all the all the ways of the, of snacking or having a large meal or whatever. I'm just like maybe if you can just talk about that with um, sex. What are the different options? And and you were talking about like all the different ways that you and you and David. What uh, our adventures look like. What your adventures look like, and then are just like you, like yourself. You're you're saying that you guys are thriving in this open relationship. I mean, I, you guys yes. really, really intensely love each other mm -hmm. and you have an open relationship and that's, you know, and it, that's counter to like 99% of I what know. you see in every television show is if my partner has sex with one other person, it's over, it's drama, everybody's family gets involved with the drama and we all hate each other. And you guys are doing the opposite of that. So We're what? You're, you're, breaking, you're breaking all the rules of, <laughs> of, of the Hallmark Channel. We're breaking, we're breaking all the specific rules, but at the core of our relationship is honesty, respect, transparency. We operate as a team. There isn't anything he doesn't know that I do. There isn't anything I don't know that he does. So at the core of it, we're, we're open with each other. And I don't mean just open in the relationship. We're open with one another. And I think whether or not you choose monogamy or polyamory or uh, an open relationship or whatever your construct is, at the core of it, you've got to be honest. You've got to be honest with yourself and you've got to be honest with your partner or partners. And I would say that is the big wow with you yeah. and your husband's relationship is that you are so open. You are so transparent. You are um, willing to engage when things aren't perfect. And I mean, I've seen all of that mm -hmm. with you guys. And then at the end of the day, there's like this deep, deep love. And again, yeah. it's like, this is just, just blows my Hallmark program brain. Because the and, Hallmark But I want to like, talk more about those. I mean, talk about how difficult yeah. is being transparent. It's it, transparent can be challenging because at times, if I do something that an old message comes back up and says that was wrong, or you're a whore, or you're a slut, it can be hard for me to, it less so now because we've been together a number of years, but in the beginning in particular, I might delay telling him something and it would cause an issue. But what I realized was that this is just my shame. This is that toxic mm -hmm. shame that we talked about earlier. Yeah. This is just my shame telling me to be quiet, don't say anything, don't have a voice, you're bad. And I have to push through that. And that's the key, I think, for anyone with being honest is you have to push through that discomfort. If you want to have a successful relationship, mm -hmm. because so, withholding it will actually cause problems. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's that, it's that darkness. It's that it's, you're causing separation with the other person when you're not being Right. And what I've discovered is that by being open with him and I've learned, he's built very similar to, similarly to me. Mm -hmm. So 
we share our adventures. We're excited by each other's ventures. I, I can't wait to actually, when something happens, I've gotten to the point where I can't wait to tell him about it. And that's allowed him to become my best friend because uh, there is nothing that I withhold from him, which is what a, your best friend is. Yeah. And having the ability to be able to share anything with my partner is just mind blowing to me because I, I didn't have that before him. Well, that whole idea of him being your best friend, just, I'm actually like emotional right now. My first job was a bar back in uh, revolver in West Hollywood. And I heard these guys say to each other, don't lie to me. I'm not your boyfriend. <laughs> Which, you know, it's, it's funny because it was hysterical, it's but it's, it's this true statement. It's how yeah. many people approach their relationship that I can't be completely honest with my partner because we're taught that we have to be a certain way. And when you, accept and move through that like i the only way i need to be is myself and yeah. the only way i can be successful in a relationship is if i'm myself and i'm honest about it and yeah that's and scary that's a scary thing to do sometimes but you get to be with your best friend yes and there, listen that this work is hard but there's gold underneath yeah and that's and I had a relationship prior to my husband where, for a lot of different reasons, we withheld a big part of our sexual selves from one another. Mm -hmm. And it led to a distance that I did not want to repeat. I didn't want to do that again. And I, I knew I didn't want that. And I knew the only way to, the only antidote to that was to be honest and open. So and, I shared yeah. with my partner with David and said, I, I don't want to be monogamous. It's okay if you don't want that because that means that we'll be good friends because I really yeah. do feel a connection with you. Mm -hmm. We won't build a partnership together, but we'll be good friends. And he actually showed up and said, you know, that actually appeals to me. That's amazing. And I was that thrilled. Um, well, so this is, let's uh, do a little, the, the, the word of the day is compersion. <laughs> Oh, God, I love that word. Can, can you tell us? Yeah, what does that was mean? That, was that coined by Dan Savage? Or was that coined by you? Uh, no, it was not my word. I forget where it came from. I'm sure I probably heard about it uh, from Dan Savage's. Uh, He's the first person program. I heard it from, too. And when I heard the word, I was blown away. Maybe I heard it from you, and it was about you were talking about Dan Savage's. I'd be happy to take credit for all the interesting things that you know. <laughs> <laughs> Compersion is the opposite of jealousy. Jealousy is a fear-based, shame-based experience, and it's destructive. Mm -hmm. Compersion is the absence of fear. It's the absence of shame. It's about being turned on by my partner's experiences and enjoying them, enjoying watching them enjoy themselves. Mm -hmm. And I love seeing my partner happy. I love seeing David have an experience that puts a smile on his face. I don't have to be the person that's doing it to him in order to feel good about it. And yeah. I actually get joy that he has joy. Yeah, that's amazing. And I think that that's an alien term, which is why I wanted to talk about compersion. And it really affects, so we're preaching to the choir here. Um, and it's lovely. And my relationship, I would say, we enjoy hearing about each other's experiences too. And it actually helps our relationship. I've just noticed in, in the sex we've been having while we're uh, monogamous during this uh, coronavirus thing, it's missing a little bit about that. We, sometimes we, we even talk about those things. We make it part of our scene and everything. It's like, oh, is this is what was going on with so-and-so? And, mm -hmm. and it's so sexy and so fun. And we get to relive our other experience. We get to sh I get to share it with, with my partner. It's a, just a cyclical thing that just adds a lot of fun energy into our sex life. Um, that just puts uh, a huge smile on my face hearing you say that. <laughs> Yeah. And since I know that um, his parents are listening to the podcast, I'm just going to leave it right there. <laughs> okay. So we've been talking about a lot about your therapy stuff and, and whatnot. Now I just want to talk to Aaron Ferranti, Alan, about being a gay man. <laughs> and Which I have um, a lot of experience doing. <laughs> I think you, you have some experience with that. And what would you say to mind telling us like how old you are and what advice you would have for your 16 year old self? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I'm 51. And my 16-year-old self, I think the biggest thing that I would tell myself is 
stop worrying about what everyone else thinks. I spent a lot of energy, I think a lot of us do, spend a lot of energy contorting ourselves to what we think other people want of us versus being our own self and approval seeking and seeking validation from others. And while I get that a certain amount of that feels good, but I think I could have spared myself a lot of pain if I had been more accepting of myself earlier. So what does he need to pay attention to if he's not listening to the voices of the outside world? My 16-year-old self? I, I think I'm going to reverse that and say not what he needs to pay attention to when he needs to stop paying attention, putting so much weight into and stop mm -hmm. uh, paying attention to is what others think. Okay. Yeah, because I think that that would liberate me. Liberation. So that goes to my, my next question. I, I'm planning on doing a piece, I haven't done it yet, on this five-step process from oppression to liberation. And I think it's, uh, I think that the gay community, I think that most oppressed communities uh, go through a five-step process from its oppression, tolerance, acceptance, liberty, and celebration. And I would argue that in uh, where we live in West Hollywood, we're somewhere between, you know, we've been through oppression, we've been through tolerance, we've we found acceptance, and we're somewhere in liberty, but I don't think we're really celebrating gay men specifically. What do you think about that? I think that is a genius model. I think when you first shared it, when I first heard it from you was when you were doing the discussion groups mm -hmm. at the West Hollywood Library, and I was just blown away when I saw it. I thought it was brilliant. Hmm. Um, Thank you. That yeah. means a lot coming, yeah. you know, because I, someone it, as... It just so clearly articulates and, and illustrates the journey that as a community, where we're, what we're on, but it also tells us where we're going. Mm, mm -hmm. I think sometimes we can get so caught up in the fight that like, okay, what is this about? What are we actually moving towards? Moving towards celebration. And I think that that's a really beautiful concept. Now I've been measuring my own motivations on whether I'm moving away for some, from something, which is fear, kind of, as opposed to going towards something, which is more love. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason I think it really changes the whole dynamic when we, instead of moving away from the oppressor and what happens if the oppressor disappears, do we exist as a community anymore? And I would argue, yes, that we do. Do you have any ideas about what celebration would look like? Well, the first thing that pops into my mind is the, the gay pride parades that we have. Mm -hmm. That looks like celebration to me. That's totally celebration. Absolutely. When um, I walk into the Eagle here in LA, that feels uh, like celebration to me. Yeah, totally. Totally. You, know, the, the, you get to be yourself and not just be yourself, but you're, I'm gonna, I guess this is redundant to say we're celebrated. Yeah. So um, I think in that area, then I think what happens in that magic space is first, like what we talked about, we see mirroring. Mm -hmm. We're mirroring each other yep. and we're able to share our, our common experience. And what I would argue is in some ways our special gifts, which I believe we have. Do you think that there's any special gifts from going through this kind of, you know, being required offers? to come out? Well, yeah, yeah I, I think this is for, for all queer people. You know, we're born yeah. this way, we're labeled a certain way, but we're really not that. There, there's um, two things that I can think of what our gifts are. One of them is our sexual adventurousness because we didn't fit into the heteronormative box. Mm -hmm. We've had to explore sexuality without a rule book and it's allowed us to be much more free and adventurous for better or worse. I think for, yeah. better, for better, but that's a gift that I think the gay community is far beyond our sexual counterparts in what we accept as sexually, quote, normal or sexually okay. Mm -hmm. We're much less judgmental as a whole about yeah. our sexual choices. And I think that's a gift. And I think we can model for the rest of the people, the people who are not in our community, mm -hmm. that sexuality can take a lot of different forms and be okay. It doesn't have to look a certain way. The other gift is that because by and large, we don't have children, 
our gifts are the arts. Those are our babies. The things that we create, whether it's music or poetry or paintings. I mean, we're driven to be creative because we don't, our, our attention and energy is not focused on procreation. Yeah. And I would, I would say too that. And I'm I, making, I just want to say, I, I realize I'm making a generalization. Yeah. And, and, and we're all speaking. Be offensive to anybody because I know there are people in our community that are focused on procreation and do want to have children. Yeah. And I think that's wonderful. If that's what people want to do and that's where they are, I support that. I can celebrate and, that. And I would say that if I'm celebrating diversity, I need to listen and understand and, and appreciate your specific view, even if it doesn't match mine. Correct. Well, that's about knowing who you are. I mean, that's another, I mean, that's a really wonderful boundary right there. Yeah. I know who I am. I know who you are and it's okay. You can be yeah. you and I can be me and I don't need to judge you or oppress you. <laughs> that creativity that you're talking about. I also, I think that, I think that we're all potentially creative, but I mm -hmm. think since we are forced to fit into a heteronormative dominant culture, even if it's pleasant, even if it's, it's not built for us. There's not a dressing room for us. There's not a, <laughs> you know, the bathroom for us, uh, you know, or just, um, yeah. So we're, I think that feeds our creativity. And I think that those, our creative muscles are just, they're buff, you know, they're uh, awesome, which is why we're able to create. Right. I mean, it's no accident new ideas. That, that gays and the gay community are stereotyped as, you know, artistic and have a yeah. fair and creative. I mean, that, that doesn't come from nowhere. There's yeah. a reason for it. And yeah. I, m my personal view is that it's because that's where we procreate. Absolutely. And it's funny, I just had another therapist on, uh, Dr. Frankie, and uh, who's a lesbian matchmaker. And she talked about the gay community as a community and the lesbian community as a community. And she said that we've led the way on helping them understand polyamory. Mm. I had never considered that before. So we're even teaching within the letters, we're teaching each other. <laughs> the L, the Gs are teaching the Ls and the Ls are teaching the Gs. And, yeah. uh, and the, uh, the trans and drag queen culture has taught me a lot about being myself and all of that. So again, when I was talking about that diversity, I I kind of bristle because I think our community does a lot of damage to itself. I'm getting on my soapbox here for a second. We do a lot of damage to ourselves when we say my way of living is the way you should live. We should all be kinky. We should all be monogamous. We should all be in church. We should all be drag queens. Whatever your ism is, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it doesn't serve the community. <laughs> So I just had to, had to throw that in there. But I think what drives that is the need for us to be mirrored, you know, which is yes. a fundamental human need. But I think that that's when it's taken to an unhealthy place. When I need to be mirrored to the point where I have to legislate or dictate or direct you to live your life in a way that has me feeling comfortable about myself, that's not healthy. That's not coming from a healthy place. Yeah. When you talk about love versus fear, that's fear driven. It's yeah like love driven it's like okay you be you but yeah and, mm -hmm. and let me be me right and if we don't match which i learned from dan savage then we just don't match on this area but let's look at all the other places we do match this right. you know or, you know intersections of identity is that's where we could just really get a lot of power as a community if we if we would focus on where we agree rather than on the places where we don't agree. Like you said, if we don't agree, we don't have to push each other to agree or have someone feel bad about their disagreement. I don't expect that people would see relationships the way that I see them. And that's okay. Yeah. And I can respect that. You know, I, I didn't always. And this reason I'm speaking as the elder that I am now, I had two great conversations with this guy who's been monogamous with his husband for like almost 30 years. He was a reverend of that Forget that that church up on uh, that we've passed by with a big rainbow ribbon on it. And I used to think of him as like a threat. It's like, what are you doing? You're being all heteronormative and blah, blah, blah. And, ah. and it, <laughs> it turns out we have a lot of common space. He cares about gay men and he wants us to be healthy and happy. And he doesn't want us all going to his church. He just wants us to be healthy and happy. And, you know, I was projecting a lot of my drama on him rather than looking for places where we can work together. Did you um, see him as an oppressor by living the way that he lived? Uh, yeah, I would have. I would say 15 years ago, absolutely. I'm just like, 
you are you are just trying to like cram this whole heteronormative thing into the gay way of existence and why don't you just be like me and live the perfect life of what the, <laughs> however i was well, living it at the time you saw him as a threat mike that's fear driven yeah exactly and when i'm fear driven i'm not going to get what i want <laughs> you know right. when i'm fear driven i'm going to find drama when i'm fear driven i'm going to get uh, i'm going to feel pain and disconnected and rejected yeah in a previous conversation you had on one of your previous podcasts you talked about being thirsty i i just loved that conversation is that about being fear driven as opposed to being uh love yeah driven? yeah thirsty is not attractive you know and that, which yeah. is not the same thing as having desire yes so desire is proud. sexy desire yes. is sexy thirst is it's needy it reads as needy it reads yeah as pulling versus desire is an invitation yeah I and i would argue pull. that I you know invited. if i'm going if I'm going out thirsty and in fear, I'm probably going to have an okay to negative sexual experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. I asked everybody three standard questions. How do you invest in yourself? How do you invest in your chosen family? And what are our special gifts? I think we covered the third one. So let me just ask that first one. Um, I ask it in a little esoteric way. It's like, how do you own your personal dignity? But what I really mean is, how do you invest in yourself as a man, just, just you as Aaron? What do you do like on a daily, monthly, yearly basis to make sure that you are stronger? God, that's such a good question. Um, I guess if I answer the question literally, what do I do to make myself stronger? I work out. Yep. And that actually is one of the ways that I take care of myself. It's, it's my alone time. It's my personal time. I put my headphones on and I go into my own little world. I don't really socialize at the gym. It's really just because I just want to have my own time and mm -hmm. my own thoughts. And that for me is crucial because I'm talking to people all day long and I'm interacting with people and I love interacting with my husband and my personal time. And I love seeing my friends and interacting with my friends. But all of that interaction also conversely means I, I need to take care of myself by myself. Mm -hmm. And there's, that's something I know about myself. You go to the gym and, um, and you, that's great. And I liked how you said that it's, because of your personal situation um, where you need to be engaged fully with mm -hmm. uh, as part of your job, that the gym is a good place to go inside mm -hmm. while being around other people and, and do yeah. things. And um, I, for one of my creative outlets is to write music. I've been a songwriter since my teens mm -hmm. and I, I haven't written in several years. I just haven't felt inspired. And then with the, the safer at home orders, I've got a lot of time on my hands to be creative. Mm. Oh, so okay, let's move on. So that's yourself. And like, how do you invest in okay, your, so your chosen family? And um, which may or may not include your bio family. I know this it, puts people on the spot. So you can either talk about who they are or just tell me about um, how you well, you're invest a in my them. chosen family. You know, Thank you. the way that I invest in my chosen family is by spending time with them, connecting doing actually this podcast with you. Um, this mm -hmm. is, has a lot of meaning for me beyond just having a conversation about sex and relationships. I get to support you and I get to show up for you. And I learn more about myself as I talk about it too. So it's good for me too. And I feel closer to you. So doing endeavors like this are mm. really meaningful. So you're like, because you know that this means a lot to me. Mm -hmm. And so you're supporting that. Absolutely. And that's a way yeah, of investing in a relationship. Garrett too. Garrett's a member of my chosen family. Yeah. Garrett's their producer, which I've yeah. mentioned once or twice. And <laughs> but and that's great. Any time. particular, like just nuts and bolts. Yeah. Um, yeah. We go away. We will rent a house in Palm Springs and invite a core group of friends and, and fam core group of chosen mm -hmm. family. And sometimes a few uh, friends outside of the circle to help expand the circle and it's those are incredible experiences i love i love doing that you know, we yeah went boat and went to lake powell and that was just phenomenal well this is what's just like i love doing these interviews because i hadn't even thought of that i'm just like i keep getting stuck on the things that i hate to do like <laughs> phone calls it's like you know <laughs> well i'm the same way i'm not a phone talker at all yeah but I've had other people say, oh, I, I call these people on a regular basis and I don't argue via text. And I'm like, 
okay, those aren't things I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for me, I've seen people in person and doing things with people like the the weekends away. I love mm-hmm. those because I love it's like the perfect amount of time. It's like three, four days, and then you can come back into your life. Yeah. And that's the family that I know about, your your queer family. How do you stay close to your mom? Because I do know that you're close. Yeah, I'm very close with my mom. And she is not the same woman I grew up with. I'm just <laughs> say, like, like, I know that she's delightful now and I can appreciate her for who she is. But it, she's like a, a different person. She, maybe it's because she's mellowed out. You know, I think that happens when we get older. We just kind of chill out. Mm-hmm. and uh, become less stressed about the things that used to stress us out. We're less fear-based, I guess. I, I call her regularly, and uh, David and I will go and visit her for a weekend, or she'll come up here for a few days or overnight. Okay. Yeah. That's fantastic. It invariably makes me laugh like every time I talk to her. And can you tell me about your, your trips to see your, your new in-laws? What have you done there? Oh, oh, yeah. They, they, they're from New Orleans. Uh, David's from New Orleans. He comes from a big family. I come from a really small family. I can count my family members on one hand. I expect families to be like drama filled and crazy and not talking to each other and fighting. And it's because that was my experience. <laughs> but mine too. Family is a lot of fun. They clearly love one another. They are very close. And for a family of his size, I think that's really a testament to what his parents have built and developed. So I'm really, I'm grateful to be a part of this family and to have been brought into the family. I feel a part of the family too. Thank you for being on the podcast. I, it's really painful not hugging you guys all this time. I know. And I look, I look forward to when we can again. Yeah. And um, I just want to thank you for being examples of dignity and of constantly growing and being fun as hell with that i'll close it out and say thank you very much thank you we'll talk to you later that was amazing mike thank you and that my friends was aaron ferranti allen he is my friend my family and a mental health professional able to navigate shame toxic behavior being thirsty and just being wonderful I hope you enjoyed the show. If you want to contact me, it's mike at girlymen.com. Send me an email. Until next time. Thanks for listening to the show, my friend. Now stay connected by subscribing to Girly Men Podcast and sharing with your friends on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or anywhere else podcasts can be found. Visit the webpage at girlymen.com, sign up for the newsletter, and find more details about each episode. Let's make this a conversation because I'd really like to hear from you. Join us on Facebook at Girly Men. Submit your questions, suggest topics, or just chat with your brothers. Want to add your own two cents? Use the voice memo feature on your smartphone. Ask a question or say anything. We just might play it on the podcast. Email the file to mike at girlymen.com. Until next time.